Next is produced at Connecticut Public Radio and is powered by the New England News Collaborative, eight public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'm John Dankosky. Thanks for joining us. On July 1st of 1999, the Edwards Dam, which stretched across the Kennebec River in Maine, was removed. Maine Public Television was there for the event where then-Governor Angus King spoke. I think we also should acknowledge that this is not all going to be easy. The upstream section of this river for the next four or five years is going to be ugly. There's going to be mud flats where there was water. There's going to be exposed who knows what. Jimmy Hoffa, who knows what's up there. But in time, nature is going to reassert itself and we are going to see the benefits of a free-flowing river for an additional 17 miles. His Jimmy Hoffa joke played a lot better back in 1999. Since then, though, the river has changed dramatically into a success story that's touted and replicated around the world. In the last few decades, states have been removing large and small dams on rivers and streams across New England, allowing fish to migrate upstream. Pete Didesheim is the Senior Director of Advocacy for the Natural Resources Council of Maine, he talked to us just after the celebration of the 20th anniversary of the dam's removal in early July. Pete, welcome to Next. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Uh, when you first started at the Natural Resources Council of Maine, the Edwards Dam was up on Maine's Kennebec River. Maybe you can talk, first of all, about the dam's place in the river and, and how long it had been there. The dam had been here in Augusta in the Kennebec River for 162 years when it was removed just 20 years ago yesterday, uh, so 20 years ago on July 1st, 1999. So it had been there, and it was controversial since uh, before it was even built. So it was built in 1837, and there were Maine residents at the time who were extremely concerned that it would have a negative impact on the fish population in the river, and that's exactly what happened because there are many, there's actually 10 different species of sea-run fish that have lived in this river that need to get to fresh water for spawning habitat. And once that dam was built, it's just it's just a concrete wall across the river, and it kept them from getting to where they wanted to be. So people were concerned about this as far back as the time when it was built, huh? Yeah. And the, the, the reason things kind of changed in the 80s, it really took the Clean Water Act being implemented in the 70s and 80s to turn these industrial rivers, which had become very foul rivers, it, 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 took those, uh, it took those cleanup efforts and the return of fish to the river for people to begin to appreciate the value of a free-flowing river. I think most Maine communities had kind of turned their backs to these these polluted rivers where the paper mills had been just dumping in raw sewage and so had our cities till the Clean Water Act started to clean things up. And as fish populations started to return and they were, you know, people started to see these fish banging their heads literally against the against these dams, people realized, hey, we need to uh, remove these dams if we're ever going to restore fish populations to anything close to what they originally were. So you and others worked for the removal of this dam for a couple of years. What were some of the, the barriers in the way? Well, there's a huge barrier. There was a, the dam owner uh, had submitted a, a request to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for a new 50-year license, and uh, that dam owner was vehement in wanting to get the dam relicensed, to keep the dam there, and continue it as a as a significant money machine for uh, for his business. Uh, he was a co-licensee with the city of Augusta, which was getting property tax payments from the, from the dam and also some revenue stream. So uh, we had to persuade the, again, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that the benefits to society of removing the dam were more important than the continued energy generation of this relatively small uh, hydro dam. We actually lost before we won. In 1996, FERC issued a preliminary uh, approval for the license. Uh, we then, a group of, of organizations, my organization, Natural Resources Council of Maine, along with Trout Unlimited, Atlantic Salmon Federation, and American Rivers, submitted a 7,000-page filing into FERC, making the case 
that removal of the dam is the best option for the river, for Maine, for the communities along the river. And that literally turned the tide, and they issued a order uh, to the dam owner to remove the dam. It was the first and only time that has ever happened where FERC has directed a dam owner to remove the dam because of the damage it was causing to the river. It is interesting that uh, back in 1999, we weren't really thinking in the same way we're thinking now about renewable sources of energy and even even small hydroelectric dams, small solar arrays or or wind turbines are being sited now across across New England. It, 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 I don't know how you think about that issue when it comes to energy production, even at the, the smallest possible level on a river versus the environmental impact and, and damage that a, a dam like that can cause. Yeah, you're raising a good issue. So the amount of power being generated by this dam was about the equivalent of one large wind turbine. But the impact it was having on the river was enormous. And and you re- we've really gotten a sense of that since its removal. So we now have tens of millions of fish returning to the river. We have the largest bald eagle population, the eastern seaboard. In a single day a couple of years ago, they counted 58 bald eagles on a five-mile stretch of this river because they were there to eat the fish because the populations were huge. Now we have sturgeon that are leaping into the air in the from the section of the Kennebec right where the dam was. And it's it's really a spectacular resurgence of life in the river. And the power that we were getting is the equivalent of just, you know, one modern wind turbine that can be placed anywhere and doesn't have an impact like that. So there is a balancing that needs to to be considered for every dam removal. Uh, Maine has probably a thousand dams and about a little over a hundred of them generate power. And a lot of those dams are blocking, you know, they're, they've outlived their useful life and they're blocking passage for fish. And And once we got through this Edwards Dam removal, I think it, it altered people's awareness of, of the fact that some dams probably should be removed for the benefit of the rivers. A, a last thing for you. It, it is interesting that this dam removal was such a, a, a watershed in the history of, of actions like this around the United States. What, what impact do you think the Edwards Dam coming down had on the the conversation around river health and river restoration, not just in Maine or New England, but around the country? I think it had a really big impact. I think that this was the dam removal that was heard around the world. There were reporters here that were filing stories in papers across the country and as far away as Japan. And it not just it, it was not just about grabbing headlines about something quite remarkable, but it really captured people's thinking and imagination about what's possible in removing some dams that have been having a pretty big impact on rivers. Here in Maine alone, because of the Edwards Dam removal, we were then able to remove the Fort Halifax Dam. And then a number of years later, we were able to pursue the Penobscot River Restoration Project, which had two large dams that were removed. And since 1999, something like 1,200 dams have been removed across the country. So we moved into an entirely new era in which removing some dams is the right thing to do, and sometimes the fish just need to win. And when they do, we achieve a new balance of river health, community health along those rivers, and uh, and that's been good. It's been really good. You know, we had 100 people on the banks of the river watching and still in amazement at at how strong this recovery has been and for what's what is quite a a wonderful and remarkable river that was damaged for a very long time and has been given a chance to come back if you want to see coverage of this 20th anniversary or of the dam coming down from 1999 you can go to our website nextnewengland.org where we have stories from Maine public Pete Didesheim is Senior Director of Advocacy for the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Pete, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Sometimes, though, our attempts to restore a more natural environment don't have exactly the outcomes you expect. Scientists at the Parker River Wildlife Refuge on Plum Island in Massachusetts 
They know that feeling. About a decade ago, they didn't take down a dam, but instead they dammed up drainage ditches to restore natural water currents in the marsh. But that project had some unintended consequences. And now, as WBUR's Miriam Wasser reports, protecting the marsh from rising sea levels means reversing that work. All right, so I'm just going to hop on the machine and get it into position. Jeff Wilson from Northeast Wetland Restoration climbs into a small red excavator. We're here today to do a tidal marsh restoration project where we're restoring tidal flow to areas of the marsh that have been blocked off for a little while. Wilson digs out small chunks of earth, clearing an area about the size of a large refrigerator. By removing this dam, or ditch plug, he's restoring a man-made canal so water can flow more freely with the tides. If we can restore a, we call it a naturalized tidal channel network, then we can restore the marsh to a more healthy state. Standing nearby is Nancy Pow a wildlife biologist at the refuge. She says saltwater marshes need water flowing in and out to stay healthy. And these ditches, which were dug for mosquito control, disturbed this flow by allowing too much water to drain from the marsh. This wasn't good for coastal birds and other wildlife. So about 18 years ago, her colleagues at the refuge decided to plug up these drainage canals. But that effort had some drawbacks. She points to a muddy area covered in green and pink algae a few feet away. Exhibit A. You can kind of see how the water has killed off a lot of these grassy areas. The marshes were flooding more frequently, and we come out here, and it would actually be flooded when it really shouldn't be flooded. The Parker River Refuge is part of the Great Marsh, the largest continuous salt marsh in New England. Marshes are really important ecosystems. They protect inland areas from flooding, provide habitat for many coastal animals, and store carbon underground. Healthy saltwater marshes are also natural buffers against sea level rise. As the tides come in and out, grasses trap sediments, allowing the marsh to slowly build up elevation. Pow was worried about the marsh eroding as sea levels continued to rise. So a few years ago, she set up an experiment. Would the marsh grass come back if they removed the ditch plugs? So this area we're walking in right now, three years ago, was open water mudflats. The difference is hard to miss. The ground is less soggy, there are more birds chirping, and there's a lot of soft green grass. We recreated this connection to allow the water to flow back out. And within a year, you know, some clumps of vegetation came back. Within two years, it pretty much looked like this. Um, It's completely revegetated. Saltwater marshes throughout New England are threatened by development, pollution, and climate change. And increasingly, scientists like POW are implementing restoration efforts that mimic nature. Though this isn't the only restoration project planned for the refuge, what makes this one exciting is how quickly it makes a difference. Pow stops to point out an area they worked on yesterday. And how long does it take before you start to notice a change? Um, I would say this summer I always expect some vegetation to come back. You know, the water drains right away, so within 30 minutes of pulling that plug, you actually see a small creek forming where the pool used to be. Over where Wilson is digging, it's time to see this happen. There it goes. The excavator scoops out the final clump of grassy dirt. And just like that, the pool of water above the plug begins to drain. In the grand scheme of things, ditch plugs aren't the biggest threat to the marsh. But Pau says removing them can at least help give this area a fighting chance against sea level rise. From the New England News Collaborative, I'm Miriam Wasser. New Hampshire's at the forefront of a growing national debate over PFAS chemical contamination in drinking water. And many of the Democrats campaigning to win that state's first-in-the-nation presidential primary, well, they're taking notice. They're using the issue to connect with a highly engaged block of Granite State voters. And as New Hampshire Public Radio's Annie Ropeek reports, local PFAS activists are welcoming this attention. Last year, a group of women from the town of Merrimack won seats in New Hampshire's state legislature. They called themselves water warriors, ready to push for reform after the St. Gobain plastics factory in their town contaminated their water with harmful PFAS chemicals. Less than a year into the water warriors' first term, they're back on the campaign trail, this time inviting all the candidates for president to come talk about PFAS in Merrimack. And many are taking them up on it, like Democratic New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. If a family doesn't have access to clean water, it changes everything. And this is an issue that is crippling communities all over the country. 
Massachusetts Congressman Seth Moulton also took up the Water Warriors invitation a few weeks ago. He got a crash course from State Representative Wendy Thomas in the chemistry of PFAS, which was a key ingredient until the mid-2000s in brands like Teflon and Gore-Tex. So what is a practical matter happens if... I mean, what are people going to use for nonstick services and whatnot? I tell everybody, get out your grandma's cast iron pants. They work, <laughs> they work then, they work now. PFAS doesn't break down in nature and builds up in the body, so it's nearly ubiquitous in people's blood and in many drinking water supplies. It's also been linked at even low levels to cancer and other deadly health problems. That's created a lot of fear and calls for action in affected areas. And these campaign stops have given voters like Suzanne Vale of Nashua a chance to demand answers from the candidates. As a president, would you be able to take executive action? What would you be able to do? Well, there are a lot of different things we could do. Um, Moulton says he'd focus on Congress and try to hold polluters accountable. That's also happening at the state level. New Hampshire is the latest to sue the makers of PFAS for water contamination. The Granite State is also one of only a few writing its own drinking water limits for PFAS, and activists like the Water Warriors want the next president to support stricter federal regulation. Our goal is to educate as many people as we can, uh, raise that awareness, and you know, by having the presidential candidates come here, um, that helps do that as well. Nancy Murphy is another Merrimack state representative who attended the roundtable with Moulton. She says this isn't just about the campaigns, but the people watching them. We need advocates, people to listen, and I think this is the first step. It's an example of how activists like Murphy can leverage the attention that comes with living in the state that hosts the first presidential primary. And the candidates benefit, too. They get a ready-made audience to hear their stump speech without any legwork by their campaigns. Another candidate joined the Water Warriors in Merrimack just a few days after Moulton, the author and California Democrat Marianne Williamson. She tied PFAS to lots of other parts of her platform, like food and drug laws, health care, and economic reform. As long as corporate money has the kind of nefarious influence on our political system that it has, we're in trouble. That's the cancer underlying all the other cancers. Advocates like Wendy Thomas see those connections, too. Thomas says her home's well in Merrimack is contaminated with PFAS, but she's just outside the area where St. Gobain, the factory that caused the pollution, paid to connect affected families to clean public water. Thomas says she could afford a filtration system, but she knows not every family is so lucky. They're being injured because because they don't have the money, and that ties back to minimum wage, and it ties back to health care. Guess what? PFAS is a pre-existing condition. Regardless of who makes it to the general election, Thomas hopes the primary campaign will show candidates her issue is one they can run on anywhere. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Annie Ropeek. Coming up, we'll visit a church service that takes place out in the woods. But first, the history of one of the first interstate school districts. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters, who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative and its coverage of climate change and the evolving clean energy economy. Support also comes from Douglas Stone and Mary Schwab Stone through the Smart Family Foundation of New York. Recording and listening back to the human voice is, in 2019, not seen as especially thrilling or groundbreaking. You've probably done it at least a few times this week on your smartphone. But imagine the marvel this must have been in the first half of the 20th century. It was the first time you could hear music that wasn't played right in front of you. The first time you could hear poets and authors and politicians without seeing them face to face. Producer No Mosbend takes us to a place on Harvard's campus that you've probably never heard of where those sounds were painstakingly preserved. Here's a story. Imagine a library for voices. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. A place where you can sit around and listen to records with friends. Until everything was rainbow, 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 and I let the fish go. And that was the Harvard Vocarium. The Vocarium was the brainchild of one person, Frederick Clifton Packard Jr. Born in Boston in 1899, he loved the spoken word. Frederick Clifton Packard is my grandfather on my father's side. That's Josie Packard. She was close with her grandparents. It was not uncommon for uh, one of them to 
break into a recitation just sort of spontaneously after dinner maybe we're washing dishes um and i and i know how unusual that sounds for most people in their family <laughs> culture but for me it was the most natural thing in the world packer joined harvard's faculty in 1920 and he later became the school's first professor of public speaking here's mary walker graham assistant curator of the university's woodbury poetry room once he was able to record the voice there was no question that that's what he should do. Packard used records for both research and teaching, and he created a makeshift recording studio in a school chapel. He recorded students when they started college and when they graduated to understand the roots of, quote, the Harvard accent. He also taught a popular public speaking course, one where the students had to make recordings. Students like a young future president. My name is John F. Kennedy. I'm going to speak this morning. He had a, a vision to create a library of voices, comparable to a library of books. But Packard had more than just scholarly motivations. He joined Harvard's faculty at a time of rising worldwide fascism. In the and totalitarian leaders who were known for their effective oratory. Packard thought public speaking education was vital for defending democracy and that listening to recordings of excellent literature was an important part of that training. In 1933, he started the Harvard Vocarium record label. It focused on poetry. At the time, recording was very new. Very few entities had the equipment to make recordings, and the recordings that were being made were not of poetry. Packer tried recording all the poets he could, and since it was Harvard, a lot of them were coming through. He recorded so many of the major poets of the mid-20th century. Authors like Marianne Moore. Known to the red bird, the red-coated musketeer, the trumpet flower, the cavalier. W.H. Auden. I suppose you could call Harvard the Oxford of America. And T.S. Eliot. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. It is, as far as we know, the earliest recording of T.S. Eliot. Eliot was the first person recorded for the Vocarium. The poet's 1933 guest lecture series at the school was seen by people at the time as significant as Harvard's first real recognition of the importance of modern poetry. There was some diversity, but the label's output reflects the tastes of mid-20th century academia. His decisions about who to contact were generated by interest, and I think that his interest was in white guys. <laughs> Sorry, Gramps. <laughs> Packard advertised the collection to home audiences in magazines and newspapers, and the Vocarium eventually released more than 500 titles. But he recorded more than just poetry readings. Here's Josie Packard. Capture, 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 capture. He just really wanted to get as much down as he could. Packard recorded marching bands, radio broadcasts, sermons, languages, accents. He even recorded the surgery of a rat. Eventually, the Vocarium became a space. When Harvard's Lamont Library opened in 1949, Packard worked with a Finnish architect to design an area dedicated to poetry and the Vocarium's collection. Mary Walker Graham explains. There were communal listening stations with a central record player. Up to eight people could sit around one record player and listen to a recording together. Thousands of students were visiting the Vocarium each semester. Packard hoped that one day vocariums would open across the country, but that didn't happen. In 1955, Harvard withdrew support for the record label. Not long after, Packard developed the first symptoms of the Alzheimer's that would eventually take his life. He retired from the university in 1965. The listening room survived, but fewer students came to visit. And after he retired, his entire department was carved out. But his work lives on. In 2003, the Library of Congress added the Vocarium record label to its collections. And over the past decade, Harvard has begun digitizing and putting highlights online. Now people all around the world can enjoy the power of the spoken word that Packard held so dear. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Noam Osman. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference.
In that story, you heard the voice of a young pre-presidential John Kennedy. Years later, just before his death in office, he signed a final piece of legislation, one that wasn't earth-shattering or controversial. It created a school district that bridges the Connecticut River to this day. Interstate cooperation is something that makes sense in New England, where our states are tightly packed together, and it's not unusual to wake up in one state and then go to work in another. But before the early 1960s, there had never been an interstate school district in New England or anywhere else in the U.S. That is until the Dresden School District in Hanover, New Hampshire, and Norwich, Vermont, was formed. Bill Hammond taught for almost 30 years at Hanover High School and was principal at the Marion Cross Elementary School in Norwich, Vermont. David Bradley is a lawyer at the Stebbins Bradley Law Firm. He was on the school boards for the district back in the late 1960s. Bradley told us why the two towns wanted to create one school district in the first place. The school was growing, and they, for the students that were there from both towns, because Norwich students pretty much all came. I think they had choice to go elsewhere, but uh, they pretty much all came to Hanover High as tuition students. And the school had grown enough that they needed to add a building or buildings uh, to accommodate both towns. Without the Norwich students, uh, Hanover had plenty of room for its students for a projection of maybe 10 years out. And Hanover wasn't going to build buildings when they didn't need to for their own children. So that's kind of the thing that got it started and that they came up with this idea, which had never been tried. We could somehow merge the two districts if we could deal with all the laws uh, <laughs> that uh, need to be dealt with and, and passed to get there. And it took some years before, before that happened. But that, that was the a core of the problem that started being discussed in the mid to late 50s. You, you're a lawyer, and, and I, I gather that there were an awful lot of legal challenges to this. What, what were the legal hurdles to overcome to do this seemingly sensible thing, uh, merging two districts that were already sharing students? Well, the, uh, you can summarize it this way, I think. The two towns had to basically get action and laws passed by the New Hampshire legislature, the Vermont legislature, and then get uh, rulings by the New Hampshire Supreme Court, and then the Vermont Supreme Court, and then develop a compact that got approved by Congress, and it was that bill that uh, was signed by JFK, and it was the last bill he signed before he was assassinated. It really is a remarkable piece of history, and let's just linger on that moment for a second. So it, it goes through Congress after these after these challenges, and it ends up on, on President Kennedy's desk. D aside from signing this as one of his last acts as president before his assassination, did he weigh in on this? Did he have an, any particular stake in this issue? Had, had he commented on, on it in any way? Not that I know of. As far as I know, this was a, simply a routine thing that wasn't controversial at the, uh, at the federal level. And uh, the two towns wanted to do this, and uh, he was not going to get in the way. But there is this interesting uh, history, though, Bill, of the way that New England states organize themselves. And there's, there's very strong feelings amongst many communities that they want to have control over their own school districts. Famously, Vermont State House and New Hampshire State House work very differently. I guess I'm wondering if there are some uh, political differences, whether at the very local level or maybe at the state level, that have thrown up uh, during your career some, some challenges to this arrangement. There are some political differences, but uh, the people who've been on the school board have most of the time been able to get along quite well in, in coming up with what they think is best for the schools. They do have separate school boards. That's one of the odd parts of this particular arrangement for this district. The Norwich School District is just one school. It's the Marion Cross Elementary School. The Hanover School District 
is the elementary school in Hanover, and then both become, in seventh grade, the Dresden School District. So these people who are on the Hanover board and the Norwich board come together to be on the Dresden board together. So they end up having multiple meetings a month to make sure that they've got everything coordinated between the groups. I think the most controversial thing has come during budget times, because during budget times, sometimes when um, all the um, interests of the schools are laid out, Hanover, Hanover tax rate will go up by 2.5% and Norwich tax rate will go up 7.5% uh, because of the percentage of students that they have in the district. So it's harder to control the tax rates in each of the individual states. But that really has been the biggest, uh, biggest issue that I've heard. Well, what about state mandates? If, if someone at the Vermont Department of Education says students in our state really need to learn this way or someone in New Hampshire say we really need to learn that way, how does that yeah. trickle down to, to you at the school district? That happens for, for um, the Marion Cross Elementary School in Norwich, Vermont, we end up having to follow Vermont state law. The Dresden School District is wholly contained in New Hampshire, and so they have to follow New Hampshire state law. So the students who are taking uh, their elementary education in Norwich may have a slightly different preparation than those in New Hampshire. There must be some sort of special sauce there, Bill. I'm wondering, uh, with your long career in this district, what do you think other places in New England can learn from your cooperation? Because I think, as Dave pointed to, there are a lot of districts that have been forced to consolidate, whether because of shrinking school populations in rural communities, you just don't have enough students in, sure. in one town, or in, in some cases... Suburbs and cities are, are trying to get together so as to provide more equitable education across town lines, which can be problematic in its own way. I guess I'm wondering, from your experience, what lessons can you pass along to other districts that are looking to, to merge, consolidate, or cooperate? Well, one, and this is not intended to be flip at all, but uh, sometimes you consolidate because you don't know any better. <laughs> and I think partly um, we had a superintendent that was quite young, and he thought this would be a great idea, and he didn't realize all the complications that were going to go into trying to put the two communities together. I would, I would say the other thing to, um, to consider is do the different towns or do the different um, areas have a similar value for what they want from education, what they want the education to look like? And since Norwich and Hanover had very similar ideas about that, in, in fact, they had already been attending the same schools just under a different arrangement, that that similar value is something that can underscore a strong and uh, confident school system. D does a lot of that have to do, though, with the fact that, that Dartmouth is, is located there and that education is just running through the veins of people who, who live in that community? I think that's central to it. Uh, it's unfortunate sometimes that that is the case, but uh, I think that is central. G gentlemen, I should have one last question for you because this uh, history is fascinating. But as I've been thinking about this, I, I, I wonder why this district I isn't called the, the Norwich Hanover School District or the Hanover hmm. Norwich School District and why it's called the Dresden School District. D do, you, do you have an answer for that? Well, the uh, and I have not done a lot of research into this, but my understanding is that before Vermont was a state and just called itself a republic, that a number of towns on both sides of the Connecticut River, which included uh, uh, Norwich and Hanover, but uh, several other towns, I think there was at least a half a dozen. Uh, towns were unhappy with uh, the ones in New Hampshire were, were unhappy with what was going on in the state of New Hampshire and the towns on the other side of the river in Vermont were unhappy with just being a part of a republic and uh, they were going to form their own republic. I'm not sure what they were going to call it. And um, they came up with the name of Dresden, and presumably it was named after the city in 
Germany, but that's about the extent of my knowledge. And someone knew that history or knew enough of that history that uh, they decided uh, Dresden for the for two of the towns involved, <laughs> Hanover and Norwich, was appropriate. Bill, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. And thanks also to Dave Bradley. Thank you, sir, for all of your knowledge and, and your history of this place. It's, it really is fascinating. Nice to be here. Thank you. Coming up, we'll visit two holy sites, one on a city hilltop, one in the quiet woods. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the John Merck Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative and its coverage of climate and clean energy. Support also comes from the Melville Charitable Trust. A 56-foot high cross looms on a hilltop above the city of Waterbury, Connecticut. You can see it from Route 84 as you drive into town. It once welcomed visitors to a popular religious tourist attraction, which was abandoned and decrepit for decades. There are still people who want to rescue Holy Land, USA. WSHU's Davis Donovan reports as part of his podcast, Off the Path, from New York to Boston. John Baptist Greco was an Italian immigrant who saw himself as sort of a present-day religious prophet. He was a disciple of Christ in modern times. Rebecca Greco Calabrese is his great-grandniece, She says Greco looked at the barren hilltop that overlooks Waterbury one day in 1955, and it just hit him. He had a vision. He remembered hilltop shrines from his childhood in Italy. Each village and villa in Italy had a saint and had a statue of a saint. That resonated with him. He decided to work on creating what he remembered in Italy. So he brought Italy to Connecticut. Greco went door to door and collected cast off scrap metal, plywood, and plaster. He actually would take pieces of people's whatever they had that they were not using and made a replica of the city of Jerusalem atop the hill. He built dozens of miniature houses, caves, and catacombs. He painted Bible verses on them and he constructed a staircase up the hill that showed the stations of the cross the events in the Bible that led to Jesus' crucifixion. Greco topped the whole park with a white cross and the letters Holy Land USA, made to look like the iconic Hollywood sign. It opened in 1956, and then Greco set out to spread the word about his creation. He would travel, and he never even drove. He traveled all over the world. He would go down to down south and he would preach. He preached the Bible and then it would, it word got out. Tens of thousands of people a year visited Holy Land USA at the height of its popularity in the 1970s. Greco's great grandniece Rebecca worked as a tour guide when she was a kid with other children in the family. They greeted busloads of tourists every morning. And we would just take them through. And people at that time, they were just enamored by it. They loved, they loved. You feel holy when you're there. Holy Land USA thrived until the mid-1980s. John Baptist Greco closed the park to do repairs, he said. He died two years later. At the same time, many of Waterbury's factories closed. Crime and unemployment went up. The city was ranked among the worst in the nation for careers and quality of life in the 90s and the 2000s. The former park suffered too. The folk art, like Greco's statues and houses, fell victim to vandalism and the elements. Then it took a dark turn in 2010, 
when a teenage girl was raped and murdered on the hill. The park is still closed today, but there's hope for a revival. Father James Sullivan unlocks the main gate and leads me into the park. There's about a thousand pieces here. Sullivan is a priest at Waterbury's Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. He shows me a hillside dotted with Greco's handmade buildings and statues about Jesus' life, like the tomb of John the Baptist and King Herod's palace. Everything from the place of the Last Supper to Bethlehem to, of course, Calvary, the peak, trying to create as close a biblical scene as it would have been 2,000 years ago. Sullivan leads me up the hill along the steep stairway that follows the Stations of the Cross. He says the ascent makes him think of a passage from the book of Luke. Chapter 14, verse 10, come higher. It's really the call to every human person. No one wants to stay in a low place. We're happiest when we, when we rise in grace closer to God. A community group took down the old cross five years ago. They put up a new one on top of the hill and opened the grounds for masses on special occasions, which Sullivan has conducted. We crest the hill and get a good look at the cross. This newest cross is by far the, the greatest. It's taller. It uh, will last many, many years, and it's very, very bright. You can see it from pretty much anywhere in Waterbury. And it's a beacon. It's a beacon to the valley and beyond. We stand at the base of the cross and get an incredible view of Waterbury and the hills around it. Sullivan points down to the interstate that runs through the city. The cars look tiny from up here. 225,000 cars pass on that highway every week. Those cars that are passing us right now, they can't see us, but they can certainly see the cross. I wouldn't be surprised if any number of them are saying a prayer at this moment. Sullivan hopes to reopen Holy Land USA. It's owned by the mayor of Waterbury and a local car dealer. They've had some fundraisers, but there's still a lot of repairs to do. I think all of us believe that there is a future here. We're looking at this as a place to come, pray, find God, find peace. And you don't have to read too far into the Bible before you begin to hear that God speaks on mountains. Even, perhaps, in theme parks. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Davis Donovan. A few hours north of Waterbury, there's another holy site that doesn't shout its presence from the hilltop. It's on a dirt road in Canterbury, New Hampshire. It's a church without walls, where the Reverend Stephen Blackmer combines Christian practice with environmental stewardship. Producer James Napoli brings us a story. It's Sunday morning. The Reverend Stephen Blackmer is ringing two large hand bells. He's calling his congregation back from silent meditation. Let us pray. God of abundance. They gather to pray around the altar. It's a small wooden table set on a sunny knoll beneath three white pine trees. On top of the table sits communion bread wrapped in foil, wine in an algae bottle, and offerings of clover, mushrooms, and berries gathered from the surrounding forest. This is Church of the Woods. Christ's peace be upon you. Reverend Blackmer isn't your typical man of the cloth. He didn't grow up in a religious family. He spent most of his career running forest conservation nonprofits and lobbying for environmental policies. By his late 40s, distraught by the effects of climate change and exhausted from battling the fossil fuel industry, he experienced a profound crisis. No matter what I did, there were ecological forces vastly bigger than anything I could stop. And it was a, a really a sense of despair, of depression. Then, on his way home from a trip in 2007, Blackmer heard a voice. I looked out the window just as our airplane was about to land and saw a church steeple near the airport. And this voice came and said, priest, you're a priest, you're to be a priest. Blackmer tried to resist the call. He had never read the Bible before and was hesitant to embrace what he believed was an anti-science faith. But the voice was persistent, and Blackmer relented. He went to Yale Divinity School and was ordained as an Episcopal priest. He moved back to New Hampshire, where he bought a 100-acre woodlot, and he heard another calling. That little voice came back and said, start a church, and a church of the woods. Oh, I could do a church of the woods. So this day we join with all the earth and heavens. In a now in its fifth year, the Church of the Woods draws a small but dedicated group of followers. 
The service is rooted in the Episcopalian tradition, with a few modifications for the outdoors. The sermon appears to be very brief, but in fact, I think about it as having three parts. There's what I say, the preaching. Then there's 20 minutes of listening to ourselves, you know, in silence, what comes up inside us, and listening to what the earth has to say through the woods. And then we come back and we share reflection, so we listen to each other. For years, I've come every Sunday, not because I have to, because I want to. That's Fred Brewster, one of a few dozen people who attend Church of the Woods on a regular basis. It does something for me to come. It's refreshing to me, and I use the Eucharist as a way of healing. So for me, it's a habit that I enjoy, and I'm replenished. Patricia Hutchins traveled from Concord, and she brought her Springer Spaniel. Molly. I always get something out of the services, and sometimes it's the readings, and sometimes it's the silent meditation. But always I feel like I've been fed at Church of the Woods. And Molly loves it too. One of the most radical departures from a traditional service is the Eucharist. Our practice at Church of the Woods is that the first piece of Christ's body of the bread is offered back to the earth herself in recognition that this meal is intended to heal the whole world and not only the human beings. And the second bit goes to our faithful Molly. (laughs) And then we pass around the bread and the wine and we serve each other. His congregation may be small, but Blackmer is not a lone voice in the wilderness. He recently founded a network to connect wild churches across North America. Like Blackmer, the leaders of these churches care deeply about the natural world. They work to bridge the divide between Christian belief and conservation science, to connect personal salvation with saving the earth. We live in a time when there's an enormous need for healing, both physical healing, spiritual healing, emotional healing. And there is something about this practice, this place and this community and this ritual, this liturgy, that does that. At its core, I've begun to think that's really what this is about. That's a healing, literally a healing of the world in this small community and ritual, in this gathering every week. My heart shall sing of the day you bring. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm James Napoli. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. You can find our show wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Next New England. If you like what you hear, be sure and rate and review us on iTunes. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Next New England. The digital producer of our show is Carlos Mejia. The executive producer is Katie Talarski. We had help this week from Emily Quirk. Music this week is by Todd Merrill, Goodnight Blue Moon, Emma June, and Karen Connolly. And this is the last week where I get to say that the producer of the show is Lily Tyson. Producers don't get anywhere near enough credit for what they do, and Lily has done more to shape the sound of what you hear than anyone else. We wish her great good fortune on her Western adventure, but I know she's always going to be a New Englander at heart. The New England News Collaborative is powered by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Connecticut Public Radio, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, New England Public Radio, WBUR, WSHU, and the Public's Radio.